Everything in the world was done to me that would have killed me. And here I am alive. From the Auschwitz experiments of the angel of death. Children, children at Auschwitz. Through decades of isolation and anger. I accuse the world of stopping to care. Eva's tough. It's bloody minded. Gestapo! Gestapo! She rose to introduce the Mengele twins to the world. She woke us all up. Launched the biggest manhunt in history. The worldwide search for this war criminal was given new importance this week. Eva's role was absolutely critical. Forgive mankind's worst crime. I, Eva Moses Kor, hereby give amnesty to all Nazis. Who I said, you're going to do what? You're going to do what? How could she possibly, possibly forgive? Free herself and start a worldwide movement. Forgive your worst enemy. It will heal your soul and it will set you free. I just wanted to, to stand up and applaud. It was like the meat of an angel. The pathway out of a dark place. A revolution of what's possible in the human condition. Even when we're all long gone. We are free. They'll still be telling our story. We are free. By any standards of the imagination, what an astounding journey. story of Eva. She's taking us somewhere and has taken us somewhere that we we need to be prepared to go. All right, so thank you, Ted and Eva, for being here. Ted, let's start with you. How did you get introduced to Eva and decide to take on this project? Well, uh, I live in Indianapolis, right by Butler University. And uh, one day, I'm sitting at home in the late afternoon, and a friend of mine from Butler calls and says, hey, I got your next one. I got your next film. And I said, well, I'm working on a film right now. And he said, no, this is definitely your next one. It's about Eva, Eva Core." And I said, what's an Eva Core?" And seriously, I had no idea who she was. And he said, she's a Holocaust survivor. And I thought, well, in all honesty, you know, with all due respect, there have been a lot of Holocaust stories. What makes this one different? He said, just trust me, come over here, you'll see for yourself, she's speaking tonight. So I go over there, uh, in a beautiful theater, 2,000 people, it is absolutely packed, I sit in the back, and like everybody else there, I am mesmerized by this woman's story. I mean, she's there, she's just telling it straightforward, and I'm also mesmerized by the fact that everybody else is mesmerized, by, mesmerized by her as well. All eyes are right on her. So I knew this is something that I really wanted to do. I waited a few days. I drove over to her museum in Terre Haute, Indiana, just about 70 miles away, and I kind of had to pitch her. And to be all honest, in all honesty, she was pretty skeptical at first. I mean, to be involved in one of these documentaries takes a lot of work. So you know, I broke out the old charm, charmed her for a while. Isn't that right? A little bit of charm? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> it took a little while, but she said, we settled on this. She said, why don't you come with me on the trip to Auschwitz and see what you think? And so I went with my co-producer, Micah Brown, and, and others from our production team, and we spent a week there. And uh, I'll have to say, I went in as a hardened journalist, and I thought that this was you know, the tough guy, and this is just another story to cover. And after three days, I was crying along with everybody else. Um, it was a life-changing trip. It's a life-changing place to go. And I believe Eva's, once I really started to learn it, is a life-changing story. I mean, you have, to, you have to see that this is a woman, this is just a, her story is a stunning psychological odyssey that is played out so, so very publicly and is rooted in the worst event in modern times and now finds this 84-year-old woman in a walker traveling the world uh, to uh, preach about healing and forgiveness and humanity. Uh, there are a lot of ingredients there, and I was uh, really honored to take it on. So Eva, let's have you tell your story. I know you speak all over the country, really all over the world, and I've been fortunate enough to see your presentation a few times. Unfortunately, I don't have time for the whole thing today, but can you talk about um, your time at Auschwitz and surviving with your sister, especially with Dr. Mengele? 
After four years of uh, Hungarian Nazi occupation, four days in a cattle car without water, just very little air, the cattle car doors opened. We had no idea where we were. And within 30 minutes, my whole family was ripped apart. Miriam and I were standing on the selection platform holding on to one another. We did not know what would happen to us. We were completely bewildered. We became part of a group of little girls, all twins. There were 13 sets of twins and one mother. One thing that I need to explain from the beginning, from the time that we arrived in Auschwitz, actually from the time we were put in the cattle car to the time we were liberated, no one ever told us where we were, why we were there, and what would happen to us. So everything was going on as it was happening. The first night we were in the barrack, these were crude and filthy, uh, three-story high bunk beds with a, be a bench in the middle, a brick bench in the middle, infested with lice and rats. We were starved for food. We were starved for human kindness. We were starved for the love of the mothers and fathers we once had. We had no rights. And somehow we had a fierce determination, which I still do not understand where it came from, to live one more day, survive one more experiment. I was used in two types of experiments. After roll call, every morning and night we had a roll call at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Then Mengele would come in in the barrack to count us in the morning. Then we got breakfast that was a brownish cup of liquid, bitter, lukewarm, cold coffee, zero calories. Then we would be taken for experiments. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we would be placed naked in a room for about eight hours. They would measure every part of my body, compare it to my twin sisters, and compare it to chart. These were not dangerous experiments. But even in Auschwitz, they were very demeaning because they made me feel like I was a nothing and nobody. So the only way I could cope with it after a while is blocking it out of my mind. The other experiments were on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, where they would take us to a lab that I named the blood lab tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm, give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. The content of those injections we didn't know then, nor do I know today. The rumor was that they were germs, diseases, and drugs. After one of the injections, I became very ill with a very high fever. I uh, was trembling as the August sun was burning my skin. Arms and legs were swollen and painful, and I was covered with red dots. Next visit to the blood lab, they did, instead of tying my arms, they measured my fever, and I knew I was in trouble. I was taken to the hospital that was filled with people who they looked to me more dead than alive. Next morning, Mengele arrived with four doctors, never examined me. He looked at my fever chart and then he declared, laughing sarcastically, too bad, she's so young, she has only two weeks to live. I knew he was right, but I refused to die. So I made a second silent pledge that I will do whatever is within my power to prove Dr. Mengele wrong, to survive and be reunited with my twin sister, Miriam. For the following two weeks, I have only one clear memory. I remember crawling on the barrack floor because I couldn't walk. And I was crawling to reach a faucet with water because this barrack was not even allocated water. 
After two weeks, my fever broke and I immediately felt a lot stronger and it took me another three weeks. So I was in the hospital of the barrack of the living dead, I call, for five weeks. I was released and reunited with my twin sister, Miriam. What I skipped over and I want to reiterate it because it was very important. That first night when we couldn't go back to our bunk beds because the rats were parading right at the bottom and our bunk beds on the bottom and we went to the latrine and I saw three dead children on the barrack floor. I have never seen anybody dead before, but that hit me very severely, violently to see dead children on the floor. So that was my first silent pledge when I said I will do anything and everything within my power to make sure that Miriam and I shall not end up on that filthy latrine floor, that we actually would survive and walk out of this camp alive. And that idea, that, uh, that mindset was that followed me throughout my days in Auschwitz. I wonder if I would have never seen those dead bodies, would I have been able to make that decision? Because whatever was wrong, I was going to somehow survive. And so I survived. I was released from the barrack of the living dead. My sister was quite sick in the barrack, but she was never taken to the hospital. Um, life in Auschwitz, for instance, I want to kind of just... Today, 74 years ago, I was in Auschwitz. And I was just trying to reminisce, and it might have been the day that we were, once a week, usually on Friday, we were taken to the showers to actually give us soap, and we watched with the soap. Actually, I figured out I was in Auschwitz 255 days. And that we found out later it was made out of human fat. <clears throat> it was had very low sodding to it. We were walking with our soap because we were given it in the barrack and we passed the shower room. And there was a chill going through all of us. Why did we go further than the shower room? Next camp was B. We were in camp A. And there were the gas chambers and crematoriums. And they told us, some people said that they sometimes had these tricks. They would take you to tell you to take, take a shower and you end up in the... And we did go, we finally entered the shower room in camp B. And we kept thinking what will come from up there came water. What a relief that was. Because what we found out later on that the sh camps and shower in Camp A, the showers in Camp A were broken. That is, but nobody explained to us anything. It was always done as it happened. And life was that way in the camp at all times. Never any information of what will happen or how we are going to. We never even knew for the 255 days in Auschwitz. We never knew how we are going to be liberated. I can tell you one thing that was a great help for me. Late in August, one day, there was an airplane flying over the clamp. That was the first time. It was flying low. I could see the American flag on one of the wings. That gave me hope that somebody was trying to free us. And hope in Auschwitz was in very short supply. There was no one to talk to and ask why was the American airplane. None of us knew. Where. And the grown-up didn't talk to us. The supervisor didn't. The air raids continued and increased. And every time they were bombing, we were applauding. Because that meant the Nazis would be defeated and we would win and we would be free. And that went on. By November, we had three air raids a day. All the experiments stopped. 
and we could tell that this cannot go on forever. But we are just going to hope that somehow we survive until the liberation will happen. And that happened late January 1945. We were free. We were alive. And it was an unbelievable day. Great. Thank you for sharing the story. Um, there's a part of the story that Ted really highlights that hasn't been told as much. And so, Ted, I, I kind of want to go to you and talk a little bit about the time when he was in Indiana and, you know, shortly after, and she's been liberated, and there was a lot of um, anger and stuff that she hasn't talked about as much about and that you captured in the uh, video. How did you get to tell the whole story? Well, well, first, I would really like, again, to thank Eva and her Candles Museum because they allowed us to travel with Eva all over the world, which gave us wonderful insight. We were able to do an interview with her in her tiny little Romania, Transylvania town of Ports uh, in the one-room schoolhouse where she and her twin sister Miriam were forced to kneel on corn kernels while all the other kids made fun of them and called them dirty Jews. Uh, we were able to interview her in the blood lab that she was talking about where they had blood drawn and, and, and they gave him the mysterious injections. Uh, we were able to interview her at the graveside of her twin, Miriam, in, uh, in Ashkelon Cemetery uh, in Israel. And we were also able, this is a real highlight, um, I think for a lot of us, we were able to interview her on a tiny little boat off the port of Haifa, where in 1950, she and her, and her sister and a whole bunch of other refugees really first tasted freedom. And, and they all stood up and they sang the Israeli national anthem. And so, of course, Eva on the boat, just impromptu, breaks into singing it. So we were able to be with her in these super important places, which helps open up. But, but yes, uh, in a deeper sense, the we reason we were able to do to get to that new side of the story was because of her courage. She uh, had the courage to open up to us things that she really hadn't opened up much about before. I, I believe generally her story before had been told in two parts, what I call part one and part three. Part one being her time at Auschwitz, part three being her forgiveness, which was in 1995. Well, there's 50, exactly a half century in the middle um, that was, it was extremely painful for Eva, and that's why she didn't like to talk about it very much. It included a really ugly, um, hard-to-watch arrest in the U.S. Capitol. And so these were, this was very troubling for her, um, but she, she did open up to us, and I think that what that showed is that it ultimately showed what kind of set the stage for the forgiveness that would change her life and has in turn changed, I would say, hundreds of thousands of lives since then through the work she's doing. So really, it was through her courage that we were able to get that full story out. Mm -hmm. And Eva, I want, to, I want you to talk about the, the forgiveness piece, but how did you come to, and, and I guess why did you decide to open up to Ted about this painful part of your life? Number one, the, talking about forgiveness is a very positive thing, and it is easier than talking about the painful things. And when I talk about forgiveness, it's difficult to mix the trauma that I experienced in the United States with the forgiveness because it makes it very long. The other thing that nobody asked me in detail, what Ted asked me. So for the old question, if you don't ask, you don't get the answer. Um, he was very determined, and he uh, researched it, and his questions were clear-cut, and there was no other way but to answer them straight on. Also, I did not really know how far he was going to go with that. As I like to tell him, you're digging into my soul, and I don't like it. <laughs> because these soul diggings are painful. And we don't really want to get every morning up and think about the worst experiences in our life. And particularly living in the United States, one would not think that my pain was continuing. And it was continuing to a very, very big extent. To be realizing that I 
I, I think that the two best government on the, which I lived were Israel and United States, but they are not perfect. None of them are perfect. And that I have suffered here in United States from things that might have happened that the government has done or people have done, that is very touchy thing to talk about. I don't really like to talk. I don't want to accuse the United States of not doing the right thing every time. But sometimes they are not. Sometimes they make mistakes. I was asking too many questions. And so that is the reason that I never really wanted to talk about it. But I wanted answers. The fact that United States uh, was so interested in the Mangala case, in one way it was hopeful, maybe they will give us answers too, right? But then they never gave us any answers, they just gave us decisions. And when the decision in 1985 uh, in June, we just went to Auschwitz in 1985 with the first group of survivors to celebrate 40 years to the liberation of the camp. And we made headlines throughout the world. And as a result of that, uh, the attorney general, uh, I think his name was Smith, uh, opened uh, the, uh, the effort in trying to uh, find Mengele and arrest him. So then by June, the United States government had a, a report that Mengele's bones were found in Embu, Brazil. They talked to many Holocaust organizations in the United States, many politicians, but not us, the twins, who were directly affected by it. And that was my protest in Washington, D.C. I felt that they should, if it is important to the United States, that they should have an open hearing in, in, in Washington and not just give us that determination. And I knew that nobody would like to, me to protest, but they saw my little cardboard. It was uh, 8 by, t by 20 cardboard. I hand wrote it that uh, memorial services are not enough. We need an we need an open hearing on Mangala Gate. They let me through the security. And then when I held it up, there they arrested me, but it was the brutality of it that was really startling, scary. And when as a detective who came on my right shoulder and actually ripped my rotator cuff, uh, this is when I began to scream. It really hurt. So what, why I didn't talk and why I talk about it now, it's never pleasant. It's never pleasant. And, and I knew that, I know that Ted knew that. But the truth might be able to help. Maybe it will, we can put that to rest. And people don't think that uh, life is just a, peaches, a bowl of peaches and cream. Life is a struggle, but to go from here, actually, I am convinced that if I would have never been arrested, I would have never forgiven the Nazis. Because from there on, I, I also wanted answers because my sister was so very ill. So I was doing everything I could do to find as much information about Mengele's experiments and did not end up with a lot of good results. But in order to go on, we need to really know as much as possible. And um, realizing that I was not going to get any, can you imagine for one moment, I am in the capital rotunda. I want to describe that to you, surrounded by all the members of Congress, by 15 or 100 or 2,000 survivors, by the world press, probably a 1,000 members of the world press. Not anybody got up or asked, what on earth are they doing to her? Not anybody ever contacted me after the arrest. Are you alive or dead? That was very scary to me. 
that that could happen. The people who I expected to help me, my fellow survivors, the government of United States, and the press. Nobody did. That was made me feel that from there on, I said I was afraid to go to Washington. But strangely, I'm not afraid to go to Auschwitz. What does that mean? That doesn't make any sense. And when the opportunity presented itself to meet with the Nazi doctor in 1993, I was very, very nervous. I was very worried. What I remembered about Nazis, I didn't, wasn't looking forward to it. But when I met him, this was the guy I was scared of, and he was treating me with respect. And the people were, who were supposed to treat me with respect were arresting me and ignoring me. Something didn't end up. And that is the way I think the mind is interesting how it works. That uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to talk about forgiveness right now. No. Right now? No, go uh, Yeah, well, that's the next question. Well, the, the idea that I asked, I met with the doctor. He was willing to tell me everything. And uh, we were, and basically it was to have a report I could take to a conference in Boston because he was not willing to go to Boston. And the camera people were wrapping up everything and we were sitting outside. It was a nice August afternoon, August 20, 1993. And I didn't really plan to ask that question, but somehow it popped into my head. Dr. Munch, you were in Auschwitz. Did you ever walk by the gas chamber? Did you ever go inside? Do you know how it operates? And he said, yes, yes, yes. This is a nightmare that I live with every single day of my life. And then he went on describing the operation of the gas chamber. He said, then everybody, he was not in the gas chamber. He was stationed outside and looking through a peephole. He said, when everybody was dead, I signed a death certificate. No names, just the number of people that were killed. I have never read about it in any book. So I told him, that was new information I didn't know, and therefore I invited him to go with me to Auschwitz in 1995 to sign a document at the ruins of the gas chamber in the company of witnesses, just what he told me. And I wanted six witnesses so nobody could say later on that he didn't sign this document. And he said, I would love to. I was pleased that it was so easy. I got back to Terre Haute. And I wanted to thank this Nazi doctor for his willingness to document the gas chamber. What I liked about it, that it was not a Jewish person, because Jews are being accused of inventing the Holocaust. It was important to me that this was a Nazi who witnessed it and was willing to testify. And I wanted to thank him, and that was a strange thing. Because I realized thanking the Nazis, that was a crazy idea. So I did not tell anybody about it because I didn't want my friends and family to talk me out of it. So I did not know how to thank a Nazi. And I didn't know where to turn. For the 10 months, every day, I brainstormed by myself. And after 10 months, a simple idea popped into my head. How about a letter of forgiveness from me to Dr. Munch? I realized that that was a meaningful gift. But what I discovered for myself was that I had the power to forgive. No one can give me that power. No one can take it away. It was all mine to use in any way I wished. And so that is the way I arrived in Auschwitz with Dr. Munch and my children. Alex was with me and my daughter, Rina. And I don't think that they really understood what that, how big that was for me. To realize as time goes on, and I am doing a lot more research on it, and I am going to write a little book just about forgiveness, my forgiveness. 
because people do not understand that accidentally I stumbled, in my opinion, on the cure for war, the secret to world peace. If every person or the majority of the people, when they are hurt, they know how to heal themselves by forgiving. There is no anger in the world. People concentrate on getting along and doing good things rather than killing each other or getting even. And the forgiveness doesn't hurt anybody. It always helps the victims. That is what it's designed to do. I did not forgive ultimately to help Dr. Munch. It started out as a gift to Dr. Munch, but it ended up as a curing of my own pain. And many people have contacted me to tell me the same thing. Right. So Ted, you got to kind of experience the other side of somewhat of a controversial message. How, um, when you talk to the other twins, the other survivors, how did they take to the message of, of forgiving a, a Nazi? Well, I would have to say that um, most survivors, probably a pretty heavy percentage, really absolutely disagree with Eva's forgiveness. Uh, you saw uh, one woman there, a lovely woman, <clears throat> uh, in the trailer whose veins were kind of popping out of her head. She was so enraged about it. We were able to interview the only set of twins uh, still alive who were with Eva in her barrack, and they have this great love with Eva and, and bond, <clears throat> but they also adamantly disagree with her. So yeah, that's something to sit down and take in. I think there are two, <clears throat> a couple of things that the main points they have um, is that how can she forgive and forget? And, and that's just flat out wrong. Uh, the last thing she is doing is forgetting. I would say that there is no other survivor alive who is working harder day to day, year to year, to keep the messages of the Holocaust alive as much as this woman right here. Um, they also say that, well, forgiveness is okay for, for maybe lesser crimes, for maybe one-on-one -on -one crimes, but the Holocaust, that's too much. That's simply unforgivable. Uh, I think I can, and this is what Eva would say, is that it's not unforgivable. And in fact, in the documentary, we were <clears throat> fortunate to interview an expert on forgiveness. He wrote the book Embodying Forgiveness. He is the former Duke, a former dean of the Duke Divinity School. And he says that for Eva to forgive the seemingly unforgivable proves that it's not unforgivable after all. That we all sort of have to look within ourselves and try to figure out why couldn't we forgive something that big? And it's, it's a tough question, you know, and I'm not here to advocate or not advocate. You know, I, I'm here to chronicle. But I will say that I have also been able to interview so many people whose lives have been changed, in some cases saved, by Eva through her forgiveness. And Ted, what's next for the, the project? Well, it's actually kind of an exciting time right now. We're in the process of, uh, we're negotiating for national distribution right now. Uh, we are entering into lots of film festivals. We've already gotten into a few. Uh, we've we've uh, received screenings so far, dozens of screenings from around, requests from around the country. Uh, and, and one thing I want to say is we're, we're very proud of, we just released an educational toolkit which is a, a cut down version of the film, one hour, along with a curriculum guide that's standards based and, and, and really, really works. And we are spreading that nationwide as well, along with the help of uh, Tanglewood Publishing, the publisher of Eva's book. So uh, to, uh, to follow along, to see our progress and to see clips of the film and all of that, we are, we are turning everybody to our website, which is www.thestoryofeva.com. So I want to open up to audience questions. So we have two microphones on each side. Um, while people are lining up, Eva, I've got a question for you. The, the last couple of years, you've become a little bit of a celebrity. You were the Grand Marshal of the Indy 500. You've become friends with Ray Allen and Motley Crue and all kinds of people. Who's your favorite celebrity that you've got to meet the last few years? That's a very incorrect question to ask. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Uh, I like all celebrities and actually all people who are interested in learning about the Holocaust, learning about forgiveness. It is a, each person relates to it differently. Ray Allen is a member of the U.S. Holocaust Council, and he has a special interest in it. When I met him, this tall guy with all his family, 
came to Miami to my lecture, and uh, he was interested in what I had to say. I was very surprised that he brought all his five children. <laughs> and uh, with Motley Crue, it was a strange, very strange Nicky, Nicky Six. Um, his burly hair appeared above my shoulder as he was putting his arm on my shoulder and I saw this dangling arm with all the tattoos and I didn't even know where on earth I was because I just turned around on the red carpet to find the right direction. You were there. I was there. And I'm trying to figure out when on earth and what on earth is happening and he smiles with his big mustache and lots of hair. Hi, sweetie. I'm saying, well, I'm on the red carpet. What do I do? I said, hi. <laughs> and then everybody told me that he was this famous. Well, I have texted to him later on, a year later. I said, you scared me to death. Lucky that you had a nice smile. That put me at ease. Who? I mean, I did not, I expected, I expected to meet media, maybe in suits or at least more civilized looking. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, she, but, what you're leaving out is right after the event, she tweeted him and said, how do I get to be a rock yeah, star yeah. like you? And he responded, well, sweetie, you have been a rock star all your life. You have inspired many people. So then I appeared on his radio show about a year ago. But the, it is, here we are. I mean, lots of celebrities. I need all the celebrities. I need all the, everybody to join in that effort to create a better understanding of how we can get along and how we can heal ourselves. Nobody can heal you. You have to work at healing yourself because it's a personal journey of going, of actually addressing what happened and coming out on the other side, feeling that you have, I have, everybody has the right to be free of any pain that anybody imposes upon us. That the survivors don't agree, they are wrong. Uh, they keep telling me, you can't forgive Nazi atrocities. Did God say that? Did God decide that Nazis are too big to, to forgive them? That is man's interpretation. Why can't you forgive the big crime that really hurt but we can forgive the small crimes. I think we should forgive all crimes, not for the sake of the perpetrator, but for the sake of healing ourselves. And once we are healed, we hope that we can teach the perpetrators to heal themselves too. Could I, could I jump in here with one little shameless promotion? Or maybe yeah, another sure. shameless promotion? We, uh, to join Eva's team, we have actually started that with uh, hashtag Team Eva. Anybody who wants to sort of follow along and, uh, and join with this crusade she's on, please uh, look at hashtag Team Eva. I want to jump in also with something because I have an app. <laughs> it's called Eva, e, capital E. V-A, without any space, and then capital K-O-R. You can click on it, you get at least three lectures, you can choose what you want to hear, and you get some other information. You can bring it up on your iPhone anytime you want to. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for coming to Google. Um, I have a question about um, forgiveness and how it might be different when the person you are forgiving or the people that you are forgiving feel bad versus don't feel bad. Um, so in the case of the doctor who um, you spoke with and who expressed to you that he felt terrible every day, I, it seems like that would aid in being able to feel forgiveness, whereas uh, presumably there are Nazis who still are alive who might not who don't feel that way who don't feel bad um, how do you feel forgiveness for those people because the forgiveness if we understand it correctly today and I agree with you that when it happened it was helpful to me that he was uh, feeling sorry 
and remorse in what he has done. If he would have yelled at me and treated me like a good old Nazi in the camp, I probably would have not been able to uh, reach a forgiveness or even want to deal with him at all. So these steps that happened, happened accidentally. But once I realized what the power that the forgiveness has, I do not care. I am sorry if they feel still angry and they want to uh, create problems. I have the right, and I, uh, it's a fairly selfish thing, but it does not hurt anybody, it helps everybody. That I do have the human right, and actually I am trying to get United Nations to change their universal declaration to human right, that every human being on the face of this earth an addendum that I would like to add, has the human right to be happy and to be free of the pain that anybody imposed us in the past, and we can do it if we so choose by forgiving. So the idea of forgiveness, I would like it to be a human right included in the declaration, but the fact that they are still mean and nasty it's more than I have the need to forgive them and just remove them from my agenda. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you. So my question is, uh, do you consider the forgiveness as the start of the healing process? Uh, or do you consider the possibility of the healing started before, even before the forgiveness and forgiveness being a uh, stage of that? I am not sure that I follow. Do you, do you need to forgive, see if I'm hearing this right, <clears throat> do you need to f be able to forgive before you can start healing or can you heal sometimes before you forgive? Mm -hmm. no, yes, that's I don't, uh, you have to forgive because by forgiving, you are removing all the pain and the burden. All the, one more thing, forgiveness gives you power over your life. And most victims, when they are victimized, and after they, they feel they, they have no power to change their life. Many people, so what can I do about it? That's it. But by having that power that we all do, we insist in every, even in worlds where, where there is a lot more problems than here, we do have the power to forgive. We don't have to make it public. But we know that we forgive. Therefore, the burden of pain is removed from our shoulder. And this is when the healing starts. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming to speak to us. You're welcome. Uh, as, you, um, as you know, we are we're technology builders. We build <laughs> telephones and uh, uh, communications systems, information, tools. Uh, you've been living a life of great purpose through a time of great technological transformation mm -hmm. uh, through the 20th century. I wonder if you can think of any time, maybe recently, maybe, maybe a long time ago, when uh, of, of a technology that helped you achieve your purposes uh, in, your, in your work for for remembrance uh, and and for justice and for forgiveness. Uh, well, it's an interesting question. I I do not agree with the word justice. Only just punishment. But I don't think there is really justice in the world. But a purpose. I mean, technology. I I am not sure if I am connected going to answer it. Um, how can I help using technology? And my philosophy of forgiveness, we, uh, the Shoah Foundation created holograms, and I have a hologram of my own. There are certain survivors who were recorded for hologram, interactive holograms. Um, I think the idea that we can spread the knowledge and information that each of us has, and we can interact, and by interacting, we can help other people maybe realize that they can do it too in their own way. I don't think that everybody will do healing and forgiveness in my way, own way. Technology, I mean, he created a wonderful film with a lot of technological parts, 
and then we are also going to make it available for schools. And that is, I do not know. I, am, I will tell you one thing that I am fascinated. I am fascinated by all these questions. Do you know that the most interesting part in the human body is the brain? Everything that we come up with, I mean, I'm amazed how long ago, over 100 years ago, people came up with ideas. Columbus discovered America. Big curiosity that we have. We can do anything. Therefore, I am convinced that we can heal all the problems in the world. If I just gave you an assignment here, every single one of you, if you ever are bored, just think for 10 minutes, what can I do to make the world better? I don't care how little it is, but every single one of you can do something to make the world better. Now, if we can use technology to enhance that, that is where the power of technology is. Thank you very much. Can I, can I jump in on this one as well? I don't think you're gonna find many more technology savvy 84 year olds than this woman right here. I mean, she's got an app, she tweets all the time, uh, and actually she delivers her uh, lectures via Skype. She gets requests from all over the world. So she really ha has been, you know, back in the days in the 1980s when you were doing all of your typewritten letters to every publication around the country, just, you know, asking them to help with your story. And here you are, and she is really reaching all around the world. And I found my typewriter as I'm moving, the old typewriter found in the garage. All right. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, my name is Rena, like your daughter's name, so that's really Oh, cool. wonderful. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I wanted to ask, so in terms of um, the Holocaust, what happened overall, and like a genocide and whatnot, do you think that we as a globe have learned from that terrible event? Or do you think that there are still more to learn? I think that technology and communication and the internet, and I will tell you why. For instance, as we sit here, there are many people in the world who are suffering lack of freedom, lack of food, lack of many things. But I was, uh, it was New Year's Eve, and um, I said, well, I am not going to go anywhere, but I want to do something unique. So I was going to help. Uh, the, the Iranian issue was on the news. They talked about the protests. Those people are living in theocracy without any freedom. It's hard for us to understand, because in the United States, we really have the most freedom that most people would have. Economically, it's very important, because if you don't have food, you cannot be very free, right? If you don't have money to buy. So we can, all of us, do something and, and in helping other people, in preventing. I mean, how on earth did Iran was able to protest the internet? So I tweeted. I tweeted, I did the following. I said, 73 years ago, I, we were dying in the Nazi camps and you, the world was silent. And I got about 26 responses. I didn't like it. So I said, 73 years ago, I was dying in Auschwitz and the world was silent and I no longer can be silent. I want you to join with me and tweet for freedom of Iran. I got 17,000 responses. So it pays to be dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> but also the fact <coughs> that they entered me in direct mail. They said nobody has their stories. They didn't know if their stories were carried by the media. And me tweeting help them find out that we knew about it. Of course, they were arrested. I don't know what their destiny is right now, but I don't think here and there I get some direct mail that we are still planning something. 
So this is a way I have a little bit of doubt that can, that easily it can be pulled off because direct mail, direct message cannot completely be eradicated. The technology is thus, thus helping break through. That people have not learned their lessons, that is another tragedy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Uh, you seem to have an immense liveness and uh, vitality. And I just wonder, where do you get it from? <laughs> what drives you? Well, when Mengele stood by my bed and said that I had only two weeks to live, I was going to prove him wrong. And I have been trying to prove the world wrong ever since. I don't know. I, 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 I'm, I feel I was in the hospital a year ago in May, and I was supposed to give the big speech that I, it was a terrific speech about uh, medicine and law and the Holocaust. Okay, that combined everything. And I wrote, worked very hard on it. And I was rushed into the emergency room for not being able, my heart was being big trouble, wasn't beating at more than zero to 40. And um, he was there at the emergency room. I said, Ted, this is the best speech I ever wrote. He said, I talked to the doctors. Can I get two hours off to give my <laughs> speech? And they said, no, what if you die while you give the speech and we don't have the equipment? I said, oh, God, that too. So, <laughs> so Ted recorded it. And then I was rolled into the operating room to get my pacemaker. And my um, recording got a standing ovation, but I didn't meet Elena Kagan. So she was in the audience. I couldn't meet her. I thought maybe she would come to the hospital, but she didn't. <laughs> it was so actually really something, because they were the co-keynote speakers. And I will have to say, uh, no offense to the Supreme Court justice, but uh, Eva's tape speech got a much bigger uh, round of applause <laughs> than Elena Kagan's did. So where do I? I, I I don't really know. I think some of it is genetic. Most of it probably comes from my mother, who uh, I don't think she ever thought she would be living on a big farm in a godforsaken little village. And she found joy and happiness in what she could, and she loved her children, and she loved being the woman that she was. Uh, she was arguing with my father about um, her four little daughters, because my father... We were religious, very orthodox Jews. And my father said, oh, the girls just need to get married and have babies, and that is. My mother said, no, my girls are going to get an education. And she never gave up on that. So as I was going to college for 11 years, every time I was struggling, my, the voice of my mother was ringing in my ears. My children are going to get an education. And her vitality and her joy, she would iron the, my father's shirt with an iron with, that had the charcoal in it, and she would put on the radio to listen to the radio, and she was happy doing what she was doing. So find happiness in any situation. There is always, you can make your life happy even when things look desperate or not very good. Find joy in something. And I find joy in the fact that I get up every morning and I say I'm still alive. Ah, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and then I say, what can I do good? What good can I do today? And that right away puts me in a good mood. Great. We have time for one more quick question. Um, I was really struck by a comment by Ted earlier where you mentioned that there have been so many Holocaust stories, so why is this one different? Um, the reason that that struck me is recent surveys have shown that as many as two-thirds of millennials don't know what Auschwitz is, 40% of Americans don't know what it is. Um, so with all those stories that have been told, what are we doing wrong and why aren't those stories resonating and spreading? Oh, that is, I don't know if I can answer that. I think that the curriculums in schools have to include the idea 
that history is important. We are the product of the past, and we have to rely on what happened before to go forward. This country was founded, and we have to learn the history of this country. So many Americans have died in World War II. So many millions of people died in World War II. There has to be a pretty big event in the world to have a bigger chapter in the high school and junior high school books. And why doesn't it? Because it is an important chapter, and what do we learn from it? Uh, I am hoping that if I am successful enough with Stan and with what we are doing, that I can stimulate more interest, so more schools. Because you, schools are controlled by school boards, and they decide their curriculum. So we are learning with uh, my publisher. I have been giving lots of lectures to school boards and school in, to, to adopt my book. And once they adopt my book, they learn a little bit more to teach it. And it's a, it's a long effort. It's a big effort. It's not, it's not simple. But I, I think your point is very well made, that we need to make a bigger effort. And all of us, not only me. So I ask you to join me. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. So Ted, Eva, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, again, if you want to learn more about the film, it's thestoryofeva.com. And so thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you.